Yeah, um, it's my great pleasure to uh, speak to you this afternoon. And um, I would like to, to really make it a session where we can have discussion and where you can ask questions. Um, as uh, thanks, Alan, for, for inviting us to set this all up. And uh, I'm most pleased to, to bring some of the work we do at UBC to the community. Um, Alan mentioned my, my primary um, area is um, history of nursing. I'm a nurse myself, um, trained originally in uh, Holland. And at some point, I came to the uh, United States first, where I did some more studies. And then uh, in the 90s, I uh, came to live in Canada. So even though I come from a very different country, I can relate um, in some ways to um, the migration experience. And um, actually, um, whereas, you know, the... I have, have been uh, always interested in how uh, nursing develops and how it evolves as a field of work across boundaries. So um, history is, is a great way to uh, learn. Yeah, please come in. It's great. We can have anybody join um, to learn how that development has evolved and, and for the people from different countries or from different fields. And although my main focus in the historical projects that I do is most often on mental health and community mental health, it's actually students uh, that um, push me to also explore other topics. And so um, even though um, and Marjorie worked with a colleague of mine, but then it turns out that I also had a student. Her name is Charlene Ronquillo, and she did a study for her master's project on um, the history of um, Filipino nurse migration to Canada. So that's sort of we both connected. Marjorie had this topic, and um, that's how I uh, got into it. Um, and so uh, a while ago, we had a, a workshop at um, UBC where we had invited uh, people from the community also, and we had um, a speaker from the United States. Her name is uh, Catherine Choi, and she has done a, a whole book on the history of uh, Filipino migration, and then particularly the connection between um, the Philippines and uh, the United States, and how that in the past has also triggered um, generation of schools of nursing, and how nurse migration in particular has become so important. So we were very fortunate to have her contribute to thinking through this topic of health worker migration, because um, as we try to communicate in our title, health worker migration is a very important component of healthcare. And um, coming from a historical point of view, I would say that has always been the case. So that is what we will try to visit today. And then think about um, the implications uh, that are actually many. So the focus that we suggest, and here you see the Philippines connected to Canada, that is our um, sort of inherent message too, because we are interested in, in the particular projects that we did, uh, be, uh, in the particular migration stream between the Philippines and um, Canada. But that is not to say that um, if you have other experiences or other uh, migration experiences that uh, you definitely can uh, bring questions around that to, to today's discussion as well. So um, as a focus, we, I will first speak um, briefly to some um, recent um, geographical trends and then uh, comment briefly on the history of um, uh, the migration from, particularly from um, the Philippines. And then Mark um, will continue and she will talk about um, ethical implications. Because there's lots of aspects we can talk about, but what foregrounds uh, in many stories from uh, nurses we have spoken with or who have contributed to the research is that ethical considerations are very prominent. 
So that is the plan for this afternoon, and we would like to leave quite a bit of time also for discussion. And we can also add always more to our presentation, so we play it a bit by ear um, as to um, what we can emphasize. Does that sound like a good plan? Good. Okay. Well, first some trends here. If you look at these numbers, um, and this comes out of Marjorie's research, as we are very proud that she just completed her uh, dissertation work, because that also means she has very uh, recent numbers. So if you look at over the last uh, 10 years in Canada, then you can see that, um, and we call uh, people who are um, coming from other countries internationally educated nurses, so that includes nurses from the Philippines, that there is a trend from um, around 2000 to uh, current of increase, and that if you look at uh, the current proportion of um, the Canadian nurse workforce, that is uh, over 8 percent, there's 8 out of every 100, is uh, a nurse uh, who is internationally educated. And from that amount of people, the nurses coming from the Philippines constitute actually a third of those people. So you can see that that is quite a large proportion. And then um, there is other countries contributing to migration as well, and that is uh, about 15 percent of that group um, comes from the UK. But if you look at trends, you can see how the number of people from the Philippines gradually has increased over the last 10 years, whereas people coming from um, the UK or um, the US here, which is a smaller proportion, I think there's more movement going from Canada to the US, um, that is then um, gradually uh, decreasing. So that's a very different pattern than what you see from um, the Philippines. Yeah, Mark is going to um, talk also about sort of what motivates people. And so, um, and otherwise we can, that could be one of your questions where we can speak to more, definitely. And the causes, um, you mean in the shift in numbers, or the differences, are often related to um, regulations around immigration. For sure, is a major factor. Because, and here you see one of these regulations. Because if you look specifically in British Columbia as to um, people who do an application to become registered as a nurse in British Columbia, if you look even four years ago, there were over 500 people successful in um, meeting all the requirements for licensing as a nurse. But then, most recently, that number has gone down quite a bit. And that is directly related to the continuously shifting regulations of both the provincial and the federal government put on um, immigration and um, opportunities for nurses to register as a nurse. So there is indeed quite a bit to say about that, and we will definitely address that uh, in the continuing of our talk. Who are internationally educated nurses, not just nurses in general. Yeah. Yeah. This is the number um, as they apply when they come, because I know some of them go through studies here too, and then they apply for licensing, right? And yeah. just to mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it so can be different patterns. It's the ones who have been educated as a nurse and they've had licensure in other countries, and then they come here seeking licensure, they apply for licensure in Canada. Mm -hmm. So this would be the percentages of those who apply has decreased from 557 in BC to 185. Yeah. No, but these are just applicants who meet the requirements. The actual number who apply is actually much higher. No? Yes. Yes. Right? Oh, these yeah. are the ones that are meeting. Exactly. They're, yeah. they're meeting. They're yeah, meeting. they have been the yeah. successful, yeah. who have been su yeah. successful in becoming licensed. Yeah. I wonder yeah. what the numbers are like that actually apply. If they were all, was it also yeah. decreasing? Um, and what percentage is it? 
are the are they getting? Is it because the? Um, yes, I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. actually, you know, we don't have statistics on that. CRMBC is not. They, they usually give only the numbers of people who are successful, mm -hmm. yeah. but maybe that comes up in the mm -hmm. other uh, aspect. Yeah, it's a really good point. Yeah. Really good. Yeah. And here, one, one more trend we wanted to speak to is that um, uh, there is other areas of work that people from the Philippines uh, contribute to, and that um, from these uh, areas of work, individuals from the Philippines uh, con uh, con um, comprise 26%, so a quarter of the people who work as nurse aides, orderlies, patient services, um, are actually from the Philippines. And then another important area of work that is not necessarily registered nursing, but it's related areas of work, um, child care, home support workers constitute 44%. Um, uh, of people, and that is from people who, who have been educated in other countries, is it? Or is it generally um, all of the number of people in Canada who work in those positions, 44% um, is from the Philippines? Yeah, this came from um, StatCan, so it's people who identify in the, um, in the um, census who are um, from the Philippines. Yeah. So they have self-identified yeah. that they're from the Philippines. And these are statistics in all of Canada. Yeah. So it's quite a substantial contribution. That is basically our bottom um, take-home message that we probably will emphasize uh, a number of times that um, people from the Philippines form a substantial component of the Canadian workforce uh, in terms of um, care-related work and uh, home support work, but, and then also nursing. So it's a wide field. So what this says is that 70% of all people who come from the Philippines are in these... No. 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 So it means of all the, uh, the nurses' age or the ways, excuse me, and patient service oh. workers in Canada, 26% are from the Philippines. So it's, first you have that group, and then you identify how many people come from the Philippines, or, or self-identify. That would be really interesting. This is 2012 statistics, but it would be interesting to go back and look at the trend in 2010, or when the, I think it was 2000, I can't remember the uh, yeah. But that, that is how substantial their contribution is. So now a few uh, comments on um, the history of, um, and as I mentioned, I wanted to emphasize and acknowledge Charlene Ronquillo, and I wanted to um, do that especially because she herself is a Filipino nurse. She has just, um, this was part of her research to get her masters that I speak to uh, from um, uh, UBC. But how she got into it was she took a class with me and she knew I do history and she said, I really want to um, get a better understanding of what um, this means because she was not herself coming from the Philippines, but her parents had. And she said, actually, everybody in my family is a nurse. <laughs> <laughs> and so she had become curious. But she is in many ways already a nurse who has grown up in Canada and has gone, happened to go through nursing school, but it has really influenced her, her choice. And so she could relate to um, this uh, particular uh, phenomena of big numbers of Filipino nurses. So that got her into the research. And then, uh, so she was part of that workshop, and Mark was, and there were some other people. But what... Um, when you think about nurse migration from a historical point of view, it's really important um, to, to realize that um, even if we look at current trends or, you know, we often sort of say what are currently the issues, Filipino nurses have come to Canada already for a long time. And so uh, the 60s is really when um, immigration on a, in a more a patterned and organized way um, started. So we have already a history here of over 50 years that we talk about. And that is why you have also nurses like um, 
Charlene, who are already second or third generations and have grown up as Canadian citizens. And I um, cannot emphasize that enough because in many ways we need to take that into consideration when we think about the contribution of nurses from um, or uh, Fil Filipino families, that they are also um, participants in, in the healthcare system for a long time. And so the first group that in the Western provinces uh, settled from the Philippines was in Manitoba, that was in Winnipeg, uh, and we had at the workshop um, some nurses who were part of that group, who were now retired, and they spoke to um, the fact that uh, they had been so surprised by the cold when they arrived in Winnipeg, but then also um, they spoke to um, how there has grown a community around um, Filipino nurses coming to um, Canada in, in, in Manitoba that has led to um, the PNAM, that is the Filipino Nurses Association of Manitoba. So they have organized themselves and in part they have done so um, to, to create support for other um, immigrant nurses coming. And then there is another group, the Filipino Women's Centers, that some of you may also be familiar with. There is one in uh, BC and one in Quebec and one in Ontario. And that is, an, uh, even though it's a bit broader focused and not specifically nursing, but these are in important responses to uh, provide a, a, um, support to um, a Filipino um, immigrant uh, nurses uh, and create a community. Uh, for the group of um, immigrants. And so when I say here who's fused, is again to emphasize that um, we would put in a plea, and that was part of the goal of the workshop as well that we did, to everybody who is involved in developing policies or developing um, regulations around um, immigration and, and Filipino integration into the Canadian workforce might really want to listen to um, contributions from these particular groups as well because uh, the, the sort of people who have experienced the changes are probably uh, giving a very different perspective than uh, those uh, of uh, political leaders or uh, regulators. And another uh, piece of um, thought that came through that workshop and was really mentioned as a, as a way to think about um, the integration process that um, from, from the research that is done, it's often emphasized how um, integration is something that uh, really needs attention because of um, the cultural differences, the healthcare system who might be different, the way people have um, grown up to become a nurse in the Philippines might be uh, slightly different than um, nurses who have um, become nurses through the Canadian system. But what is not considered, but uh, Filipino nurses in particular, once the ones who were retired, brought up how that might also be an untapped resource. How could more um, Filipino nurses be incorporated within the hospitals and within the healthcare system as to uh, participate in uh, the transition process. So that's why that is placed as a question mark, with a question mark. So when, when you look at the broader history that um, I mentioned already, that uh, migration in many ways is a permanent characteristic of um, the history of healthcare. And when I say permanent, is that there's always um, movement between countries in establishing um, a, a, a workforce for the hospitals. And one of the driving forces is here, um, in particular, um, when there are become uh, exist a shortage of workers. So there was a big expansion of hospitals in the 50s and 60s 
So it's not a coincidence that that was also the point when immigration from the Philippines started in Canada, because then um, public health insurance had become established and hospitals increased. And so one um, persistent uh, response has been to recruit people uh, from other countries. And so um, that actually builds upon uh, a longer tradition. If you think about Canada as a country, it is basically a country of settlement since um, cent for centuries. And so the earliest settlements also that were actually in the 1600s, I don't know if um, any of you is familiar with developments in Quebec, but Quebec was the first province where they built hospitals, but they were built um, by um, groups from France who came, but they brought um, with them also uh, sisters, sisterhoods. And so already from the 1600s on, there is those patterns. And we don't, we don't tend to call that immigration, but of course that was also big time immigration. And so that is a foundational to, to how Canada has evolved. And so why I mention that is that um, that puts a perspective also on the groups who actually settled and actually, yeah, please come in. Yeah, that's great. Just join. Um, because uh, even though we, we tend to think about uh, the contribution of uh, Filipino nurses in very recent times and in 20th century history, it is uh, one group about a continuous stream of immigrants who have helped build hospitals. And as I said, I have the students often make me think about new topics, but currently there is another student in our school. Her name is Helen Vandenberg, and she does a study on how in, um, and I, you might be familiar with it, but in Richmond there is this area called Steveston. And in the late 19th century, so that's more than 100 years ago, there was a Japanese hospital that was established. And that was not top down that the government said, oh, let's build a Japanese hospital. That were actually Japanese immigrants who felt that was very important. And that were also um, missionaries from Japan who actually involved themselves with the immigrant community. And so um, that is one other ethnic group who has had a present and that unfortunately um, stopped abruptly uh, with the start of the, or in the middle of the Second World War when Canada um, was one of the nations joining the anti-Japanese um, uh, counter attack and then uh, uh, all the Japanese uh, citizens in Canada, in, in BC and the other Western uh, provinces were interned. So that stopped that particular hospital. But another uh, example is um, the uh, Chinese community. They also have always had hospitals that were um, to this day called uh, and, and considered um, Chinese hospitals. They might not be called this, this, this way, but for example, um, in Vancouver, um, St. Joseph Hospital, I don't know if you've heard of it, but that is uh, established by people from the Chinese community. Mount St. Joseph, yeah, 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 yeah. Thanks for that correction, yeah. And so um, there was uh, already in the late 19th century uh, a Chinese hospital in Victoria, one uh, in New Westminster, uh, and that uh, Mount St. Joseph uh, was established. So the, the diversity amongst people in healthcare and amongst um, health services is often way bigger than we tend to think, or that is tend to, to pre be presented in official reports on healthcare development. And then in, from a historical perspective, a few comments on regulation. And I, you see here where ethical considerations uh, slip in because the question is really, are regulations a help or a hindrance? And um, ongoing uh, and in relation to, to that question is um, tension 
over licensing. Even though in nursing we are proud to be a, a profession that has self-regulation and we have um, fought hard to put licensing in place, with migration and uh, people coming from various countries, there is also um, always tension over these regulations because as much as it is designed to uh, enhance quality of, of the healthcare system, it is also uh, sometimes a hindrance in terms of uh, making it possible to actually work in another country. And it can be um, denigrating. And I can speak to that um, experience myself when I wanted to go to the United States to work as a nurse. Um, it was actually a friend of mine who was already a few steps ahead. She said, you need to, do, to take these tests. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh, and so um, that's put me on the road that uh, probably some of you can relate to. But then I had just completed my master's degree in Holland, in, in, um, philosophy, and I was planning to actually go for a master's degree in the United States. But because of these regulations around the test, and I don't know what went wrong in my request to take it, I got this whole package in the mail, whether I could actually please prove that I had elementary school education. I <laughs> thought, so, oh no, and so, uh, you know, it's just sort of, I think it might speak to some of your experiences too, that you then suddenly feel from here to there and back and forth. And so um, I think that that is a common characteristic of what happens um, as soon as you begin to move between countries uh, professionally. So... Um, what is then the case with uh, the regulation in Canada, and, and Mark will give more details, is that um, there's often extra demands placed on people who migrate. And so in the U.S., in the 70s, there was this commission on graduates from foreign nursing schools that you had to take a specific language test. And we had a similar phenomena quite recently here in B.C., where there was extra practice hours as a regulation requirement. And so even though these um, demands sometimes also change with lobbying and um, explaining, they also put that sort of pressure on people. And so um, that um, you can see how, how these his rules and regulations have their historical development in itself, and you, you will give some more details on that. But then um, that it should not get into the way of also acknowledging the contributions people make um, throughout that process as well. So I, I will invite uh, Mark to speak some more to that. Okay, thanks. So, um, yes, as Ellen said, my name is Marge Hawkins, and um, I just completed my uh, PhD research study looking at the experiences of nurses educated in the Philippines seeking licensure in Canada. So as a nurse educator um, responsible for teaching internationally educated nurses in bridging programs in BC for about the past 20 years, I became increasingly concerned that many of my students, despite efforts to, to pass the requirements and integrate into the workplace, weren't, weren't able to complete the requirements. And it was my students that really inspired me to, um, to pursue this research topic. And, um, and so today I'm going to be presenting you just a very small um, overview of, of my project. I started it in 2010 and just completed it this year in 2013. So, um, and I'll be interested in your feedback too. Now let's see if this works. Oh, just a minute, I have to turn it on. That always helps. So um, I um, formed an advisory group of nurses educated in the, or not all educated in the Philippines, but there were five nurses 
um, who helped me with the um, recruitment of participants and the data collection and interpretation of the findings. And of those five nurses from the Philippines, four had become nurses in the Philippines. So they were my advisory group. And we were very fortunate to have support from the Multicultural Helping House um, and also from other immigrant serving organizations such as Skills Connect, BC, Success, and they were very supportive of the research study. So overall, I had an opportunity to interview 47 participants. And um, these were nurses educated in the Philippines. And I should say the reason I focused on nurses from the Philippines is, um, as Girch has said, these nurses make up the greatest percentage of internationally educated nurses in Canada. Plus, they have a long history of nurse migration that we can learn from. So they became the focus of my study. And I also wanted to, to draw on nurses who had, been, who had come to Canada within the past 10 years. So looking at um, the sample, the average age was 37. Um, the majority were females of the people I interviewed. And they came to Canada through a variety of immigration pathways. Most came through the Federal Skilled Worker Program. However, I also interviewed eight nurses who came by the Living Caregiver Program. Um, two who came um, already with RN positions in Canada through the, uh, te with temporary work permits, and then two came um, with their families. And they had a, a diverse um, nursing background experiences, ranging from being volunteer nurse, or volunteers in the Philippines to working in the Middle East. Um, to 17 years of experience as a medical surgical nurse. So I was very lucky in getting a very diverse sample. And uh, we collected data from individual interviews and also focus group interviews. So what I'm going to be presenting you today are really the voices of these nurses um, and what I learned from them. And um, I selected core themes from the interviews, and I sort of plotted them along a trajectory that began in the Philippines and progressed to Canada. So indeed, their experiences in Canada seeking licensure were determined by um, structures in the Philippines as, a well, as well as upon arrival in Canada. And um, I grouped these according to the first theme, um, Seeking Greener Pastures. And uh, the second one, let's see if this works up here, um, It's Not for the Faint of Heart. That was the theme that predominated for those upon arrival in Canada. And um, the third, and one block after the other. And this seemed to summarize the, their stories um, as they applied for licensure in Canada. And indeed, there were two sort of struggles going on. There was the struggle of the new immigrant to Canada and the struggle of seeking licensure. And, and then I also looked at their um, thoughts about the future. I have to move on. Um, today, probably due to time constraints, I'm just going to be focusing on um, the first three. Um, theme. So with respect to seeking greener pastures, um, I explored, um, well, actually what came out of the discussions, with the, there were two issues. One was making the decision to come to Canada, and the other was how to prepare to come to Canada. And both those, the decisions and the preparations, seem to have implications um, on, on licensure um, experiences in Canada. And it seemed that their decisions were often embedded within socio socioeconomic um, inequities in the Philippines. And this is what um, encouraged many to migrate, as well as they wanted a better future for their children. And they're also seen to, they also seem to be influenced by uh, the colonial relationship between the Philippines and the U.S. with this notion that life would be better in Canada, that Canada was really a part of the, of the U.S. And there was a certain status associated with coming to Canada. But with respect to the socioeconomic inequities in the Philippines, as this one nurse said, and she actually came to Canada uh, with a temporary work permit, we have to spend everything that we, that we earn just to come up with the millions of pesos that she, her daughter, had needed for the hospital. So we are, we are totally bankrupt. 
That's the reason I came abroad. This was this nurse's particular reason. And I must say that there is a, div a diversity of reasons. There, you can't at, at clump everybody together. But this was one of, one of the factors was the socioeconomic inequities. Um, with respect to preparing to come to Canada, they often referred to the fact that they had to, there were numerous stepping stones along the way. And the first stepping stone was becoming a nurse. Hi, welcome. Come on in. <laughs> um, yeah, so there were um, numerous steps um, to, if they, if they set their sights on immigrating, that the steps they had to go through. And the first was often becoming a nurse. And um, the participants told me that it, becoming a nurse was a very expensive endeavor. It wasn't one that everybody could, um, could pursue. And in fact, um, pursuing nurse, nursing often meant taking out loans, borrowing money, and arriving in Canada um, in debt already. And as one said, because private schools are expensive and they just accept students. I mean private schools just taking out money from people. Um, so this was a theme that often came up. But I also have to say that um, there was there's a whole range of, of nursing schools in the Philippines, of course. And again, uh, the, there's a danger in generalizing. But to pay attention to the fact that um, it was an expensive endeavor and certainly not one that everybody could pursue. Um, with respect to arriving in Canada, um, the stories between the federal skilled workers and the living caregivers and the two who arrived as temporary work permits were quite different. Um, for the fe federal skilled workers, unable to work um, immediately or in a timely manner as RNs, um, they were then um, faced with how, how to survive. And I'm sure um, some of you can attest to that. It sounds like you've been through that yourself. Um, and as one said, when you come here, you have nothing. You are nothing. And this, um, you know, they also explained how um, they were often fairly disappointed because as federal skilled workers, they came here on the basis of their education and their work experience. And, and yet when they came here, as we know, um, regulation is controlled at a provincial level, and even though um, the CIC um, determines whether you can come here based on your education and skills, it's the regulatory bodies, as you know, in each province who actually determines whether you're competent enough uh, or competent as a BC graduate to work. So um, this was a major obstacle, the fact that coming here hoping to nurse in a timely manner and um, not being able to do so um, created numerous issues, including poverty, um, further feelings of marginalization. Um, the living caregivers, on the other hand, even though they did have employment when they came, they were constrained by the nature of their living caregiver contract. And um, immigration policy dictates that you can only have, I think you can't go to school um, for more than six months um, full time. And so that really limited um, following up with nursing education once in Canada. And then also they were constrained by, the, um, by their employer. So the employer having this um, you know, control over whether they were permitted, for example, in this case, to even attend English classes. So these were major challenges to, um, upon arrival in Canada at least. To, to being able to continue with your RN um, education or upgrading. Um, and then with respect to um, becoming licensed in Canada, all of the participants expressed feeling overwhelmed by the nature of the requirements to become a nurse in Canada as, as internationally educated nurses and felt that they were met with one block after another. Um, as this one participant said, after this one, they will create another step, another criteria, instead of helping these skilled workers get into the right track. So they felt um, rather sort of marginalized, quite marginalized by the whole process. And indeed, when you look at the steps required for registration, um, there are numerous steps. And I find um, as a uh, 
a, a Canadian educated nurse looking at these different steps, I find it very daunting myself. And we often used um, focus groups um, as I was collecting data as a means to problem solve and work together to try to understand how, how to work through these different steps. And it, it wasn't easy. Um, so the ones in purple that are highlighted in purple here are the ones that um, have, have had significant changes um, really um, since about 2006, 2007. And interesting, um, this process has become more rigorous as the number of nurses from lower income countries has increased. As Gertje pointed out at the beginning, you could see the difference. Um, nurses from educated in the Philippines um, has been increasing, whereas nurses from uh, coming from the UK and the US have been decreasing. So there's been, um, you know, this is all. This process has become more rigorous. Um, English language proficiency requirements have become more challenging. Um, there's been the introduction of the um, what they call the SEC or the Substantially Equivalent Competency Assessment. And this was established about in 2007 because with the increased number of nurses coming from other countries, um, the regulatory body said that it's more difficult to track their education and their experiences. There's so many different schools, different programs, and so they wanted a unified means of measuring competence. So this was added, and it is um, the SEC can take um, anywhere from half a day to five days to complete, but it has to be completed within Canada. So, um, and they recommend, the regulatory body recommends not immigrating to Canada until the SEC has been completed because the SEC will help to determine what upgrading you need. However, as the participants in the study told me, it's virtually impossible to take the SEC um, before you actually immigrate here. It means coming to Canada as a visitor, getting a visitor's visa, say from the Philippines, coming here, going through the expense of traveling here, staying here, taking the test, and then returning to the Philippines. So they basically told me impossible. So that means that many come here, um, everybody in, in the study I was involved with had not completed the SEC before they actually arrived in Canada. So this was a, this SEC is a new requirement, and um, and then following that, as I mentioned, um, the requirement for taking educational upgrading, which can be a very expensive endeavor, and with long wait lists, and uh, there's also the national licensing exam. Until um, June of this year, there was also the requirement that went into effect about 2007 for 250 hours of, of Canadian work experience, meaning that um, internationally educated nurses needed to find an employer to hire them to complete 250 hours of work before they could get their license. And this became a major um, stumbling block for, for many nurses and with quite a few um, volunteering their time in order to get the 250 hours of experience. I think there was enough um, or there was significant reaction to this requirement that this requirement was changed into or removed in um, June of this year. So this no longer is a requirement for registration. Yes. Mm -hmm. it was important in that workshop that we had all these people drawn together that I talked about, there were a substantial number of nurses from the Philippines, but there were also um, nurses from the uh, college of the Red Institute. Uh, BC and you. Mm -hmm. BC. And it was striking to me because I learned about this requirement during the workshop. And the Filipino nurses were telling how difficult that was because there was not only the fact that you have to do it and find the employer, mm -hmm. but the way it was framed as to having to find a supervisor, what employers often misunderstand mm -hmm. and get suspicious. Mm -hmm. um, 
made it even harder. And it was as if the regulators heard this for the first time. That they said, oh yeah, but it's all to help you. Then the nurses said, well, it doesn't really help that much. <laughs> and it, it was as if it woke them up. So I, I honestly think mm -hmm. that um, mm -hmm. these sessions and bringing people together is where you can exchange mm -hmm. and then having um, the, 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 the policy makers actually realizing mm -hmm. the experience that it is worth mm -hmm. us as mm -hmm. public universities to make these experiences public. Right. Because otherwise they may think they are doing a great job helping and they may not realize what the actual impact yes. is. Yes, I think they got quite a bit of feedback. And uh, as a matter of fact, I also presented them. I had a meeting. I went to the college and presented them with the findings from this research. This was back just when I finished collecting data in 2011. So, they, they, you know, it does, as Gertrude says, it really is helpful to have uh, people coming together. It makes a difference and, um, and speaking up. Um, okay, so moving forward. Um, it's important, but these are the, again, result, resulting from my um, study. I think that it's really important for nurse educators, regulators, to acknowledge that the integration of nurses in Canada is very complex. And rather, just fo rather than just focusing on downstream approaches about how to best sort of educate them in nurse refresher programs, we have to look at some of the larger, broader issues about why there is a shortage of nurses in Canada? What is the work environment like that is perhaps fostering a shortage? And who are the nurses coming in to work in these environments that perhaps Canadian educated nurses um, don't want to work in? That's one thing to consider. There's many others. It's very complex. And also to acknowledge that um, experiences or structure shaping experiences, processes shaping experiences here in Canada often begin before they even, the nurses arrive in Canada. So there, it's multifactorial. Also, we need to challenge our current practices that are currently disenfranchising particular groups of nurses. Increasingly, I found that this, the participants were feeling marginalized, they were feeling often exploited and powerless. So I think we have to really examine um, what we're doing here as Canadians to be, you know, fostering that. Um, we, need to incur we need input um, from internationally educated nurses at each point of their trajectory. And this is what you were just talking about too, Gircha. It's really important that we come together, that there is a voice. That's how we make change happen. And, these, and nurses have to participate in the decisions that are affecting them. You know, we need to hear from those nurses who are being, in, um, having, um, being in, impacted by, our, by these decisions. And we need to collaborate with stakeholders who are involved in regulation and education and immigration. Bring the people together. Listen to immigration counselors from immigrant serving organizations. Also educators, nurse educators, regulators, union members. Um, it's really important to bring everybody together. The immigration piece is so important. As you know, there's been changes to immigration policy just since July that's having a major impact on nurses trying to come here from other countries since nurses have now been removed from the occupation skill list, list so they're not getting priority status anymore. So it's important to have collaboration and also as Gircha has mentioned before, it's really important that we all continually recognize the contributions that internationally educated nurses are making to our healthcare system. The fact that they are contributing now at 8.6 percent of our nursing workforce in Canada is extremely significant. Therefore, these nurses need to have more of a voice. Um, and it's really interesting to keep in mind that even though the numbers of internationally educated nurses in Canada is increasing, these numbers only represent those who have completed the registration process. So we don't know the numbers who actually come here and, and are not able to get licensed. And that's something that we, I think it would be a very good follow-up to this study to actually find out what happens to these nurses when they come here and they can't um, 
get licensed to work in Canada. Are they filling these more these service jobs that we mentioned earlier in the trends as far as um, nurse nurse um, aides, orderlies, patient service workers, um, uh, home care makers, home care workers? Yeah. So there's lots of ethical considerations. And now questions. Thank you. I see we're almost at two o'clock here, but sorry, we we've, we've well, talked okay. longer, and I, I just would love to hear from you people because you're the voice of the experience yeah. sitting right we here. Have a bit of time. Do we? Uh, okay. We have a bit of time, so for the next uh, fifteen to twenty minutes, if you have questions, uh, and if Gucci and Marcia uh, yeah. Sibyl definitely can ask questions. Uh, so Our comments. Have you been involved at all with any of the organizations um, of uh, the war on faith of Philippine nurses? Are many of you nurses educated in the Philippines? Like most of you? Or? Yeah, a lot of um, people that I know and that I met here in Canada, they are all nurses, but they came, um, they also work in Saudi Arabia like me. And what I found out is it's easier for us to um, have the regu um, be regulated here as a nurse if we come directly from the Philippines because the only thing that um, they need is our um, license, that you're licensed in the Philippines and that you work there and, uh, and all the other things. That it, except like in Saudi Arabia, it's really hard to ask for the government, like the Saudi Council, like for that um, paper. It's harder when you're not there anymore. So that's the one thing that's complicated. That, yes, and that was actually um, a finding from the study as well. Those who came through the Middle East, with it, they often found it very challenging to get the referral or the letter recommendation, employer reference from the Middle East. However, they also came with rich experience yeah. and um, with a lot of experience. Um, so, but yes, you need the, that those letters. Yeah, yeah, actually, like the hospitals are okay. It's just like the government body that like the, the that govern it, just like uh, the. Um, CRN here, but so like a Saudi council there, it's just the hard thing. Right. Like, yeah. But and if you just came from straight from the Philippines, it's easier. Easier to get yeah, your easier papers. Easier to get your papers. Right. Than right. Right somewhere else that is uh, like hard, like especially like Saudi Arabia. Right. That's why in the immigration also when you apply for your permanent residency, you yeah. don't really ask for the um, police clearance. Because they know that it's hard to deal with the government of Saudi Arabia, so I hope like that the CRNBC realize that that it's really hard to deal with them. I know they do recommend on their website that you try to get your documents before you come to Canada, but I know that's no not always possible. But the thing is, even if they have completed their application, let's say, for example, they submit an application package to become a permanent resident here, um, providing that police clearance that they have secured from Saudi Arabia, but then the, the time, you know, the, the, the end of the process, they would still ask for the current, yes. the current police certificate. Yes. How come? Yes. They've already been here for more than two years. They're no longer in, in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, but yeah. we still ask for that particular document. Right. And it's going to be very hard for them because they're no longer in, in the kingdom. And if you're going to process or ask for that police certificate, you have to be there or get someone who's in Saudi Arabia to process that for you. Yeah. And <laughs> what if these people do not have a relative exactly. or no yeah. friends at all in yeah. the kingdom? So nobody can process that for them. Yeah. Yeah, that is something that Charlie also found that the immigration streams um, can vary quite a bit. People come through other countries or might eventually have their, have their end goal um, coming to the U.S. but then going through different other countries mm -hmm. and um, that makes the whole um, process even more complex. So that, that sometimes causes the delay for these people to co to become permanent residents, so they are like just waiting <coughs> for that particular particular document for them to become permanent resident, for them to move on 
and enroll in, in certain schools because this, these schools will not accept them because there are still temporary residents here. Like if they're still temporary foreign workers or they're still in the living caregiver program or even if they're holding on an open work permit. Uh, like UBC, they will not accept this these uh, applicants. Once they're permanent residents, yeah, they're not able right. to apply yeah, to be you know, to get into this it's not only about becoming nurses, yes, and being nurses that's also right. the whole, so uh, they, they, they want to move on they want to get into a program to, to get a certificate or to <coughs> a refresh report for yeah. example mm -hmm. the first be yeah. but because of the delay of the immigration process and the immigration and, and another piece that came out of the, the interview that and you probably also to when you are in the position of being able to get clarity on the process, <coughs> that there were striking stories of nurses who had then come um, from the Philippines as um, uh, through, through the living care program, for example, and so that then the families who they were with were also not always sometimes not helping or not aware, and then to to realize where to go or how to to move and go through the process, mm -hmm. getting that information is very, very difficult. So that, that was another piece to really emphasize the importance of um, the uh, organized bodies amongst mm -hmm. the Filipino nurses themselves. And the retiredness is also spoke to that, as to um, that they felt that when they came in the 60s, she said, um, licenses were basically handed down to us. That there was no process. <laughs> <laughs> and so then, um, that she had a really strong message to, to the current nurses to, because now the process is so much more bureaucratic that it almost makes people more afraid mm -hmm. to step forward and connect even with their own peers mm -hmm. from, from similar Filipino families and she really encouraged to say how important it is to, to make connections because um, now even more than in the 1960s is that you need that support to to find, because it's not only, like you say, about becoming a nurse, it's about establishing a life and finding all the resources and uh, so you may not might be about with the children and, and stay connected. So do you want to speak to Well, no, this, uh, I totally agree with everything you're saying. <laughs> um, but as, as the findings from my study showed, and I mentioned earlier, there were two struggles going on, and that was being a new arrival in Canada and also trying to get through the licensure process. And they both had um, an effect on each other. You know, it's very difficult when you're struggling to survive in Canada to at the same time being able to afford uh, to go through the, um, the licensure. It's, very, it's a very expensive process. Uh -huh. There is some funding, or there has been some funding, but it's not always reliable, and it does, or it's not always there. And um, it doesn't cover all of the expenses. And as, uh, participants would often tell me that if it meant, if they had to follow up with a nurse refresher program, that meant they weren't continuing, because they couldn't afford to be a student, a full-time student, and um, also be, pro be providing for their families at the same time. So that was the end of their nursing career. I, yeah, I just wondered along that track, I wondered, um, because I know it wasn't mentioned in the study, how many of these, those who apply, um, a percentage of them may not have gotten their license right away. They may have been required to get additional education yeah. and how long that took. Um, do you have those numbers? Um, well. I only interviewed participants twice, once or twice during the study. So they were at various points. So I don't know how many actually completed of the, of the participants I talked to. I was focusing on um, structures that shape their experiences, like their you know finance, their family support, their nursing education in the Philippines, their experience before they came to Canada. Reg regulatory structures, what you know, anything I could learn from them about what was shaping their experience. 
So I didn't do sort of, a, I didn't track what happened to them eventually. Mm -hmm. So that, again, is um, another, would be a, a very good research study to follow up on how many actually are able to get through the process. Because like she mentioned, somebody mentioned that some of, some of the nurses come in as even caregivers, yeah. and I believe you have to be in that program for two or three years before you can even apply for an open permit, right. and then getting the permit, and then moving on to the next step, yeah. and that whole process alone can be five years, At least, or, or, or longer. When you yeah. cannot I know. You can get the full, I know. Right? and then by that time, it's too late. Yeah. That's right. I mean, the yeah. regulatory body does say that they like you to have so many hours of work experience within five mm -hmm. years. Yeah. But if your contract is 24 months, you're living care, and that could be spread over four years, and then you have to apply for open work permit, and that can take up to a year. I know they keep changing. They're saying you're getting it quicker, but I don't know. And then permanent residence. Sorry. This is also a struggle between the federal and the provincial levels, right? Because, yes. Uh, licensing is more on the provincial side. Yes, yes. And immigration is on the federal yes. side. Exactly. So I'm so happy that you did this research. It's a good uh, study and um, it's well founded. And um, for a wake-up call for the regulators, I think we have to bring on like the different colleges and universities should, you know, work as a team and, you know, cascade the, the findings and invite our regulators. I totally or we can agree. furnish a copy to the Foreign Credentials Recognition Office. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. just says we'll be there to help out because this is a fight for our clients who have been here as nurses, who have finished as even caregivers mm -hmm. and uh, now moving on to PR and wanting to practice. but ending up in odd jobs. Yeah. Because exactly. I noticed from your statistics you said some end up as care aid supports or whatever. Yeah. But it's just sad to hear some of them are not on that list. Exactly. They are really on the other side. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. But they're very smart. Yeah. They have yeah. all the necessary experience yeah. to prove. Yeah. So in any ways we are there to support that you know how we can yeah. really move regulators and you know there. <laughs> right. Well, that. Mm -hmm. And sorry, not to say that there's anything wrong with those other occupations because no. they're needed for absolutely the health. Yeah. Uh -huh. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But if, you, have a if you if you went in to have a career in nursing, mm -hmm. and then uh, you you cannot practice what your mm -hmm. profession is. Then. That's right. I think you you also found that um, and we didn't specifically look at it, but. Uh, uh, many nurses get licensed as practical nurses as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it does change. I mean, there were some participants in the study who did decide to go the practical nurse route. And I, in the nurses I've taught as a, in, uh, in, as a nurse educator in refresher programs, quite a few were coming through. They already were RNs in other countries, but they were trying to become practical nurses in Canada. So that option is available for some. However, um, the English language proficiency requirements right now are actually higher yeah. for the uh, private, for the College of Licensed Practical Nurses of BC than they are for the CRNBC. Mm -hmm. So that's a problem because it's English language requirements that are often one of the biggest deterrent. You have to have that English language piece before you can even um, mm -hmm. submit your application. So that perhaps is changing too. I don't know, we haven't had a chance to actually look at the consequences of having an increase in English language proficiency at, the, at, at higher level, at the CLPMBC level. But um, I agree with your point about there needs to be collaboration among all the stakeholders. Um, just the, the fact that perhaps the regulatory bodies don't understand the immigration process. You know, participants would say to me, they'd go to the college and ask them a question about immigration, but they'd say, no, you have to go to immigration to ask that question. Mm -hmm. And yet it has an impact. And so I think it's important to bring everybody together. It's really important to get these results out in the community, rather buried than buried away in the library at UBC. And um, and I thanks to Alan for um, giving me this opportunity and Kirsha for bringing my results to you. 
But I think we need to move beyond that too and, um, and have some work groups. I'm hoping to, um, my plan is to present my findings back to the immigrant serving organizations who were supporting the research. And um, but it really, there is a need to move forward. Mm -hmm. Is this apply, um, I applied in the U.S. Like actually, I applied for um, uh, what's that? Like the essential uh, NPEX yeah. in California, and I did it like without any like hurdle like this. Yes. Yeah. So I did my NPEX. Actually, I did it here. So yeah, it's good, but I can't just work there because like my family is here, so I can't do right. that. Right. Yeah, and it's hard also for the immigration to yes. apply in the hospital. They have to get right. to Russia. So it's yeah. just like, you yeah. know, but why it's perfect. easier there? Because you can, <laughs> now you can be ready in the NRS there. Like, and you know. certainly. But then here, yeah. you can. Like, they didn't <laughs> even give you a chance. Like, just to take the exam or whatever. But well, it's, in, it's interesting because when I presented the findings to um, uh, my uh, defense, to other academics at UBC, they were saying, you mean it's more difficult to get a license in Canada than yeah. it is in the U.S.? Yeah. yeah. You know, why is that? Why yeah. is it more difficult? They don't even ask for your, actually, your experience if you're working. They don't yeah. want that. But they just want your education. Yeah. And um, if you are licensed in the Philippines yeah. and, like, and other things that yeah. they yeah. verify for you. Right? Even the English exam, they don't need it yet. But eventually, if you want to work there, they will need it. But when applying only for evaluation, they don't really need that. So it, 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 it makes it easier. Well. Yeah. Now, you know the NCLEX is coming to Canada, right? 2015 will be the first time that we won't be writing the CRNE anymore. It'll be the NCLEX. So whether or not, though, you can write that exam, in the Philippines before you come to Canada. I don't know. That's the way it is for the U.S. and other countries, yeah. right? Yeah. Hopefully that's the way it is for Canada, too. And I'm, I'm sure it's moving in that direction. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming.